Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you for those of you who are here joining. Um, I'm going to be presenting today about de-escalation strategies. Um, this is a topic that I deal with quite a bit um, in my work, uh, the trauma work that I do at CVSS, um, but I'm sure that it's something that could be applicable for all of us, regardless of where we're uh, working or if we're in the community. Um, then, you know, or in our personal lives, there's always moments sort of to, uh, to work with de-escalation. Unfortunately, crises are everywhere. So I really hope that this training is uh, applicable and helpful for a variety of different um, areas. So as you can see on the slide, I'm Joanna Jeffries. I am a mental health counselor, and I currently work for Family Services Center for Victim Safety and Support as a trauma therapist. Also, I just want to note that uh, this training was initially put together a few months ago by myself and Tina Klosius, who is our clinical supervisor at CVSS. We initially created a de-escalation training specifically for our program. Um, so some of what is in these slides, I've you know, modified it and made it kind of more generalizable, but some of what's in the slides was put together by Tina. So I certainly want to give all the credit where credit is due on that. So just to kind of orient you to what we're going to be going over today and some of the goals that I have for this training. Um, this training is first and foremost to provide education and information about escalation, clearly, uh, crisis, trauma, um, and really with the purpose of empowering staff or community members to feel confident and feel in control when clients or individuals you're working with present with some type of agitation. And I'll provide appropriate trauma-informed strategies that staff or community members can use to help clients return to baseline while also meeting their needs and prioritizing safety always. Also, just a little note, uh, I am going to use the word clients throughout this presentation. That's kind of the framework that I come from as a therapist. I, uh, you know, the individuals I work with, I refer to as clients. I know that's not necessarily applicable to everyone. So when possible, I'll use more general terms. But of course, for those listening, you can just fill in the blank with, uh, you know, whatever, whatever word would be most applicable for your situation. So when I say clients, I really just mean whoever you're, you're working with in that moment. So I wanna start out with some definitions, just making sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, a lot of the words that I'll talk about can at times be used interchangeably. So I wanna be really clear about what, uh, what they mean in this situation, in this training. So crisis, is any event that is going or is expected to lead to an unstable and dangerous situation affecting an individual, group, community, or a whole society. So clearly we can all relate to this because we're all in a crisis right now, unfortunately, with COVID. So that's obviously something that has led to a lot of instability and potential danger for uh, our whole society. Escalation is an increase in intensity or seriousness. So clearly today we're going to be talking about de-escalation. So it's important that we recognize what escalation is. And it's just um, an increase or something becoming more intense. Agitation is a state of feeling irritated or restless or kind of feeling shaken up in your emotions. So not necessarily really extreme, um, but it could be the start of escalating further. Grounding uh, are therapeutic techniques that involve a person being reconnected to earth. I'll briefly share about grounding exercises later on in the training. Uh, typically when someone is escalated or in crisis, they're not very connected to their environment, to the earth, to the people around them. Um, so grounding is a technique that can be used to help them come out of that escalated crisis state. 
A few more. So dysregulated or dysregulation is when a person is briefly incapable of regulating or controlling their emotional response. So I think this one's really important to kind of note and think about um, that when we're helping an individual or a client who is escalated or who is in crisis, they may not be fully able to control that response that they're having or fully control the escalation. And that doesn't mean that someone should not still have agency when they are dysregulated, but I think it's important for all of us um, as um, you know, individuals who may be trying to assist in an escalated situation to recognize that that person may not always be fully in control. Baseline is a starting point used for comparison. I'll mention this several times throughout the training. Um, and, you know, baseline can be different for different people. So for some folks who are managing um, maybe mental health symptoms, um, you know, they have an ongoing mental health diagnosis, baseline may include some level of delusional thinking. Um, or for some of us, maybe our baseline is more anxious than for others. So we certainly don't always know uh, what each person's baseline looks like if we're just maybe meeting someone for the first time. But just bear in mind that baseline can look different for different people. Distress is uh, extreme anxiety, sorrow, misery, or pain that is currently happening. It says my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you can hear me. Please let me know if you can't. Um, and then lastly, de-escalation, which is of course the theme of our whole training, um, is just the reduction in the intensity of a conflict or a potentially violent situation or an intense emotional state. I want to point out with that one that um, some escalated situations, some crises are potentially violent. Um, and of course, you know, that's kind of, at least for me, that's what I always think of with de-escalation. Um, we think of, you know, someone getting really angry or aggressive or maybe uh, de-escalation in the context of law enforcement. Um, however, that's not always the case. So really what we're going to be talking about today is verbal de-escalation. Um, you're certainly not going to be prepared after this training to manage any kind of uh, a physically violent escalation. Um, so really today we're going to be focusing on kind of the, uh, the conflict or emotional intense uh, piece of escalation. Another quick sort of disclaimer I want to make with all the definitions is that this is not a um, sort of certified or official crisis intervention training. And uh, for folks who are working in different settings or you know, if you're gonna be in a hospital setting or uh, some other type of maybe uh, you know, inpatient mental health, um, workplace or environment, these words may have different definitions. So this is just what uh, we, you know, Tina and myself had compiled uh, from our research. So just bear that in mind. These are not necessarily generalizable to all settings. This is really specific for this training in particular. So moving forward, um, now that we're kind of all on the same page with some definitions, this infographic on the screen shows the stages of escalation. There are some different um, types of, of this chart that you can find online, um, but this one, they all have the same basic gist. You know, there's this buildup, a peak, and then the escalation decreases. So the first stage of escalation is calm. The individual is at their baseline, whatever that looks like. They're able to be cooperative. You can reason with them and talk to them calmly and safely. And then there's some type of a trigger, some type of unresolved conflict. And a trigger could be an external event. It could be an emotion. Somebody may feel, for example, rejected, and that could be a trigger that leads to escalation. Trauma can also play a role um, if someone either experiences a trauma or following a trauma experiences a trauma reminder, that can be a, a major trigger. We'll talk a little more about trauma in a few minutes. But there's some type of unresolved 
conflict, whether that's in someone's external environment or internally. And then we see in stage three, uh, there's some agitation. So the individual is kind of increasingly unfocused or upset. Um, they've experienced the trigger and now they're having some type of a response to it. And then stage four, we see acceleration. So the, the conflict or you know whatever the trigger was remains unresolved and the individual begins to kind of hone in and focus only on that trigger. That kind of takes over their awareness. And then at the peak, we see some level of, you know, maybe out of control thinking or behavior, out of control emotions, or there's some severity to the behaviors or the thoughts that are happening. Um, so that, again, can look very different for different people. So my emotionally escalated peak may be very different from your emotionally escalated peak or somebody else's. So just like baseline looks different, that peak can look different as well. And then in stage six, there's been some experience of kind of venting of that peak level, whether the person talked through it, whether it was just time that went by, whether there was some sort of resolution to the trigger, um, whatever the case may be, there is this de-escalation that happens where the severity subsides and oftentimes we feel kind of confused at that point. You know, we may be processing um, the trigger that happened, our response to it. Um, so there can be some level of confusion when an individual is coming out of that peak stage. And then eventually we'll see recovery. So return to baseline, the individual will be more calm, more cooperative maybe, more reasonable. So I want to note um, on the side of this little chart, um, the word aggression is used a couple of times. And as I said earlier, and this is going to be a theme that I'm really kind of driving home throughout this presentation, um, peak can certainly mean aggression. It can certainly mean anger or rage, but it can also mean intense anxiety or intense sorrow. So again, try to think of peak not as, you know, somebody's um, punching a wall necessarily. It could be that, or it could be um, someone is really uncontrollably um, crying, for example. So another piece of this slide I want to point out is this comparison between non-crisis thinking and crisis thinking. So when we're not in crisis, take hopefully all of us right now, hopefully none of us uh, are in crisis at this moment, um, we're all able to be logical. We can all think abstractly, we can be reasonable, and we're able to be reasoned with. Um, that's kind of, you know, the, the baseline non-triggered state of mind. However, when we're in crisis, um, our thoughts become increasingly illogical. Uh, we have to be more concrete. There's not so much of that abstract thinking. And it's really difficult to focus and reason through something. So when we're attempting to help someone who's in crisis, we need to be aware of where their capabilities are. Um, they may not be able to follow kind of a, a reasonable and logical line of thinking. They may not be able to absorb a lot of information and focus on what we're saying. So when you're managing a situation where you believe that someone is escalated or in crisis, try to really think of, um, of this, you know, of, of what they're kind of capable of uh, taking in at that point in time. So there are many types of escalation. Um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I really liked this list that I found in my research because I think it effectively covers some different reasons that people may become escalated. So first would be loss of reality. Uh, this might be someone who is experiencing uh, dissociation. They may be experiencing some paranoia or delusions. Um, they may present as really withdrawn or uh, really confused. So in that moment, they may need some grounding exercises, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. 
Um, and then loss of control. So someone who is feeling out of control or feels that they have no power over their life or their circumstances may present as angry or manipulative or hostile. And the reason for that may be because they're trying to retain some sense or regain some sense of control. They may really need some help diffusing that anger and some listening and maybe they may need to be given some options to let them know the areas in which they do have control. Loss of hope is one that I know I see fairly frequently working with uh, people in therapy and you know I'm sure all of us can think of some examples of whether we've ever experienced this or an individual we're working with or in our personal life. Um, I think kind of the ultimate loss of hope would be um, being suicidal and you know considering seriously considering suicide but also loss of hope may just look like deep pain anguish um, so an individual who's escalated um, due to loss of hope may need to some help on instilling hope and work around you know what would help them to to feel a sense of uh, future orientation again and then loss of perspective. So someone who is struggling with loss of perspective may present as really anxious, really, maybe really grandiose, um, or with a lot of panic. They don't necessarily have a perspective on their life or their problem or you know the, the trigger um, that triggered their escalation. Um, so they may need some, some assistance with uh, calming, soothing, redirection, reassurance, um, you know, to, to kind of help them not perseverate so much on maybe the one issue that's creating that anxiety or panic. So again, there are many other reasons or categories of why individuals may become escalated, but I think that these four really kind of capture all the different um, sort of underlying factors that may be going on for, for people who are dealing with escalation. There are many factors that can impact escalation. Um, when we're attempting to help someone or we're in a situation with someone who's escalated, we're seeing kind of one moment in time. So I think of this like the iceberg analogy, you know, maybe the escalation that they're presenting with is what is floating on top of the water, but then below the water, there can be all these other factors that are playing a role in why they have become escalated to that degree. So of course, mental health, um, if someone is managing an ongoing mental health you know, diagnosis or mental health symptoms, um, those could all play a role in why they're escalated or the way that they're escalating. Substance use or abuse, if someone is currently under the influence of drugs or alcohol, uh, they may present as more escalated or maybe as more withdrawn, depending on you know, what, of course, they're using and their body's reaction to it. Stressful situations. Um, you know, I can certainly think of moments when I've met with clients and at the time of our meeting, they, they became escalated or they seemed really escalated already. Maybe they were, you know, maybe a little snippy or aggressive with me. Um, and then I learned and they shared that they just experienced a really stressful situation. You know, maybe they went to family court and lost full custody of their children. So again, we might be seeing a moment in time and trying to intervene in that kind of in the moment escalation, but there can also be so many factors that are underlying that. Emotions, uh, someone may be presenting with one emotion, maybe anger, but underneath they're feeling fear, hurt, pain, rejection. Um, a whole constellation of different emotions are, are possible beneath just the one that we're seeing in that moment. Trauma uh, has a huge role. I'm going to talk more. I have a whole slide about that next, so we'll just kind of skip over that for the moment. Um, a medical condition. For example, if someone is experiencing chronic pain, that may very well increase their reactivity to triggers in their environment. And understandably, you know, they're, they're under constant physical stress and strain. So again, just something important to bear in mind that may be underlying the uh, behaviors or the words that we're seeing. And then changes in career, financial, or relationship status. 
So again, going back to the stressful situations piece, uh, when someone is experiencing major changes or transitions in their lives, um, clearly, you know, that's going to hit, impact the way that they interact with the world, maybe the way that they interact with their emotions or the way that they interact with their past trauma. So next, as uh, promised, I will talk about the role of trauma. Um, this is not, again, by any means a, uh, a training about trauma and the brain. That's another wonderful training. Um, but I just did want to share here that trauma has a profound impact on the brain and the nervous system. And as hopefully we're aware, or if not, then I'll share with you now, um, our, our nervous system greatly impacts how we interact with the world and how we interpret uh, events that happen, you know, how we interpret maybe things that seem threatening in our environment um, or crises. So the impact of trauma can be emotional, physical, psychological, um, and it can range in severity. So someone could have maybe mild uh, emotional trauma symptoms or really severe that impact them every minute of the day. Clients can feel so many different ways, uh, numb, shocked, angry, scared, helpless, uh, which may lead them to presenting as irritable, rude, tearful, hysterical, frantic, panicked, unfocused, unresponsive, agitated, confused, upset, depressed, dysregulated, and the list could go on and on of different ways that trauma symptoms present themselves in different individuals. So again, in not, there are definitely going to be situations where we're trying to intervene and de-escalate and we don't know the person's history. We don't know um, what their, you know, how their trauma symptoms are impacting them. But it's really important for us to bear in mind, you know, if the person is trying to communicate to us, you know, that they were triggered or that something reminded them of a past traumatic incident, um, it's important that we're aware of the profound impact that that can have on that individual. And, you know, another little kind of uh, way I like to just sort of sum this up for myself um, is when I'm interacting with someone and they're escalated and, you know, maybe I'm having a hard time with, with helping to intervene, um, I always like to ask myself the question, what, what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you? I know for many of us, myself included, you know, when we see someone kind of acting out in some way or behaving in um, a hostile or, or an escal emotionally escalated way, um, our mind does kind of jump to, whoa, what's going on with that person? What's, what's wrong with them? Why are they acting this way? Maybe they're in public, you know, what, what's happening? Um, when a more productive question would really be to ask ourselves, what has that person experienced that has led them to this point of escalation. So I do kind of want to take a step back from talking about the individuals we work with and talk about our own safety. So before we jump into all the interventions and techniques I'll talk about, um, again, I want to remind all of us that uh, this training is really about verbal de-escalation, um, not about intervening when and individuals behaving in a violent or unsafe manner, um, our personal safety is, is paramount. Um, there are moments where we're, we're working with someone and there is potentially a threat to, to our safety or you know, maybe someone has made threats. And that's a moment when we really do need to utilize our resources, you know, our supervisors, security staff, whatever is available to us to, to be safe in that moment. Um, also, while it's incredibly important to acknowledge what people have been through and, you know, the role of other factors in their escalation, it's also completely acceptable to set limits and boundaries. And if someone is speaking in a way that is inappropriate or unsafe for you or maybe for others in, in that room or in that environment, it is acceptable to say, you know, I, I can't allow this to go on, um, you know, however you would phrase that. Um, that's perfectly acceptable and appropriate. Abuse is not the same thing as escalation. You know, none of us deserve to be abused or should be abused um, in, any, in any context. So try to just bear that in mind as well. 
there are certainly reasons for why people act the way they act, um, but that doesn't mean that any of us should be or deserve to be abused in any way. So um, I'm not sure, I don't know if I can see a chat. I just wanna make sure there aren't any questions. All right, I don't think there are. So if anyone has any questions or thoughts, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I would love to hear any additional thoughts or anything that I missed. So if there's nothing, uh, I will jump into the next piece of the training, which is really uh, the techniques and the strategies that we all can use when we're attempting to help someone to deescalate and return to their baseline safely. So I've split this into a few different kind of categories of techniques. So the first is your approach. Um, the way in which you approach someone is, in my opinion, equally if not more important than what you actually say or the interventions that you actually use. Your approach is an intervention in and of itself. So respond as a nurturer, not as a rescuer. I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but I know for me when I'm working with someone and they're in crisis and they have a need or they experienced a trigger, um, I really want to kind of fix that for them. That's my kind of automatic thought. I, I jump into rescuer mode and that's not necessarily beneficial for us or for our clients. It doesn't help us because we're not rescuers. In the next bullet point it says you're not a miracle worker. You can't fix everything for a client. And it doesn't necessarily help our clients or the individuals we serve either because they also have agency and they need to, at times, be the ones to solve their own uh, concerns or uh, return to baseline from their, the trigger that they experienced. So it's really important that we identify our role and what we can achieve in an interaction with someone um, who is escalated because that the expectation needs to be set of what we really can accomplish and what what we can help them with in that moment so that there's not kind of an unrealistic expectation that we're going to somehow fix whatever triggered them. Be a mirror. So this can kind of go one of two ways, um, but I love this mirror metaphor. We can mirror a calm demeanor, a calm tone, a soothing approach, a helpful approach, uh, we can mirror cooperativeness, and hopefully our clients will mirror that back to us. We can also be a mirror, unfortunately, uh, in a negative sense. We can exhibit defensiveness or an argumentative stance or, uh, you know, being kind of aggressive back when someone gets aggressive with us. Our brains have mirror neurons that lead us to unconsciously kind of mimic what we're seeing in the people that we interact with. So try to remember that. Try to remember the power that you have in these interactions to mirror what you would ideally like to see the other person exhibit. Be non-defensive. If someone is trying to engage with you in some kind of an aggressive way or is asking you challenging questions, you really don't need to engage in that way. There's typically no benefit to that when someone is in crisis. Treat everyone with empathy, respect, and dignity. Um, at times, you know, if someone is maybe going through some type of a crisis and, um, you know, perhaps they're regressing or they're, uh, you know, decompensating and maybe some mental health symptoms are coming out, um, Still, even in those moments, that's not a time to talk down to anyone or to degrade anyone's dignity. Um, in fact, that could further escalate the situation. So our hope is always to return to baseline before a person even gets to that peak level five of the stages of escalation. So anything we can do to minimize further escalation is so important, and that starts with our approach. And part of our approach is how we speak, our tone, our volume, our rate of speech, um, maintain a calm tone, a, a peaceful, you know, quiet volume, and a slow measured rate of speech. Of course, not too slow to be kind of 
condescending, um, but I think we all know kind of what a, a calm tone feels like. So that really covers um, our approach to clients. And then the next piece of de-escalation is our body language. You know, we've all seen those statistics about how much of our communication is made up of our body language. So again, this is a piece that's probably even more important than the more concrete interventions that we'll talk about next. So make appropriate eye contact, um, not too much to where you're like staring someone down because that can certainly be aggressive in and of itself, um, but enough to show that you're really listening. Move slowly. There's no need to make sudden movements that might startle someone. Stay at least two to three feet away. And that's really for our personal safety. Of course, if someone's escalating in an aggressive manner, we want to be appropriately distant. Uh, well, actually, I wasn't even thinking of COVID. We should probably be at least six feet away at all times. So maybe I should update the slide to reflect that. Um, but just thinking in terms of safety, it's also important that we're distanced from uh, in individuals because they may not feel safe with us being really close. You know, if someone is escalated in a really emotional manner and is crying, it may be our instinct to, to touch them, um, but that may not feel safe to them or appropriate to them. So maintain an appropriate distance. And again, COVID six feet at least, um, keep that in mind as well. If possible and if safe, be at the same eye level. Um, I think it's personally always best to both for both parties to be sitting. Um, just because I think that kind of brings the temperature down a little bit. Again, if it's not safe, you know, if you need to be near a door or standing, of course, prioritize your safety. Keep your hands in front of your body, you know, just so that the individual you're, you're uh, helping is, you know, aware that you're not kind of reaching for anything or doing anything that they'd be uncomfortable with. Appear open, relaxed, and self-assured, even if you don't feel it. Um, this is definitely one of those moments where fake it till you make it can be really helpful. Um, you know, if, if you're demonstrating that you're confident and that you're okay with what's happening and you're able to help the person through this crisis, then that can help them to feel more comfortable and thus become less escalated. Avoid shrugging, pointing, eye rolling, any kind of body language that implies that you don't really care, there's nothing you can do, um, you know, that you're not really being helpful or kind of minimizing what that person is experiencing. So the next piece are our listening skills. So this may feel like something that's pretty basic. I know as a therapist, you know, I've heard the listening skills spiel a hundred times and active listening and all that. Um, but I really don't want to minimize the importance of listening skills in de-escalation. So many situations in which a person becomes escalated and, and, you know, agitated and kind of moves toward a peak point are so many of those situations are because they're really not feeling heard or that anyone really cares and is absorbing what they're trying to communicate. So... I like these three words, attending, following, and reflecting, to kind of sum up the listening process. Attending is basically that act of listening. You know, you're really hearing what the person is saying, you're taking it in. And then following is just tracking with them as they speak and as they let you know what's going on and why they're in crisis and what they're feeling. You know, nodding, um, you know, eye contact, like I said a minute ago, maybe a little verbal gestures like saying, mm hmm, yes, I hear you, things like that as they're going through their narrative. And then reflecting, paraphrasing or summarizing what the person shared with you to let them know, I really heard you. Or to let them know, you know, if, if you miss something, that gives them an opportunity to say, that's right, but you missed X. This phrase, ventilation and validation, I think is also really helpful uh, to bear in mind. So again, often what somebody might need to de-escalate is just to ventilate, to get out what they're experiencing and what they're feeling. And then to hear some validation, to hear, yeah, that's, that's awful what you went through, or you know, I understand why you're feeling that way. Um, again, that right there is an incredible intervention that can either prevent a peak moment or help someone vent and, and come down from that. And throughout uh, someone speaking to you and sharing with you, use open-ended questions. 
Um, again, if appropriate, this depends on your role um, as well. You know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, potentially someone who's an office staff, maybe you, it's not necessarily appropriate to kind of keep encouraging more um, sharing, or maybe if you're in a situation where uh, the person has escalated in front of many other people, um, you may not want to kind of keep opening up the communication, but when possible, when appropriate, use open-ended questions like, can you tell me more about that? What happened next? To really open the communication rather than putting up a barrier to someone. This next slide is just some helpful phrases or kind of keywords that I have found really, really helpful. Um, and the research uh, that I did for this training also reflected. So I'll just read through them. You're safe now. I'm glad you're talking with me now. I'm so sorry that happened. It's important to say that really genuinely. It's not your fault, if appropriate. You're not going crazy. What you're saying to me makes sense. It makes sense that you're feeling that way. Things may never be the same, but they can get better. And you are not alone. So each of these phrases in different ways validates what the person is experiencing. It lets them know that you're there to help. Um, and it lets them know that their emotions are appropriate. You know, it makes sense that you're feeling that way. It can be so powerful in just letting someone know, I hear you, I'm with you um, in all the emotions that you're having right now. So now we're gonna get into a few more kind of concrete interventions that you can use to assist someone in de-escalation. So use positive and helpful statements that put you on the same side as the client or as the individual. Um, I really like to use we instead of you. So something like, yeah, you know, we really need to figure out where, what to do next. Um, that kind of aligns you with the client and joins you with them rather than just saying, yeah, you need to figure out what to do next, you know, and that kind of puts you in opposition or at the very least just not really with them in solving this problem. Assess for the person's current safety. Again, this may differ depending on what your role is and what your relationship is with the individual. As a therapist, of course, you know, I do suicide assessments or homicidality assessments. Um, for others, you know, in different roles, maybe that means putting them in touch with Helpline or if they're a victim, say, of domestic violence, maybe putting them in touch with our hotline. So always consider what is the safety of this person who is in crisis. Give permission, quote unquote, to feel intense emotions or no emotions. So I typically would not use the word permission uh, with a client, but I'll often say something to the effect of, it makes sense to me that you feel that way. Um, or you're allowed to feel that way. You know, you're allowed to feel any emotion. Um, and that just lets people know, hey, it's normal. It's, it's okay to, um, to feel the way that you're feeling. Provide brief, concise psychoeducation on trauma just to normalize what someone's experiencing. So again, you don't need to know everything about trauma in the brain to just let someone know, um, for example, when we experience trauma, we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode or when we're triggered, we can go into that mode. And that kind of gives a person potentially some insight into what just happened, you know, why they were triggered and what happened afterward. And that can help to just normalize and let them know, you know, you're not, you're not crazy, you're just going through a trigger. Um, and that might help clear up any confusion they're having about what they experienced. At times, redirection is necessary when someone is really perseverating on uh, maybe an anxiety provoking situation or something that they really don't have control over. Um, again, we can use COVID as an example. I'm sure we've all experienced some anxiety around this situation and have needed to just ultimately redirect ourselves and focus on other things so that we're not um, hyper focused on something that's out of our control and spinning out into crisis mode. Provide choices and options. Again, this goes back to that escalation due to loss of control. Um, give the people that you're working with as many choices and options as possible. Even if they don't like their options or even if they feel like they don't have many options, um, try to brainstorm with them and, and just give them any level of choice and control. And connect people with resources. You know, something that I say to people all the time is, I'm not necessarily the person to help you with that, but let me put you in touch with the person who can. 
or I'll talk to them and have them reach out to you. Um, again, just letting people know you're there to help them through this crisis. Um, they're not out on their own with no support. A few more interventions. Um, encourage self-soothing. So think of the five senses. You know, when someone's in crisis, you can ask them, what would feel, taste, touch, smell, sound um, soothing right now? You know, what do you, what do you do when you're upset? What food do you like to eat? What, um, you know, music do you like to listen to? Just thinking of the basic five senses can go a long way in soothing someone back down to baseline. Brainstorm safe and supportive people as a resource and plan who they'll reach out to, when, and how. Um, often when someone is in crisis or recovering from a crisis, um, they need extra support. So talk with the escalated individual about who supports them and then how they'll reach out to them. Surprisingly, silence can be an intervention. Many of us are pretty uncomfortable with silence. It can feel weird or awkward, but sometimes it's what the person needs. We don't always need to be talking or offering a solution. Maybe they just need to cry or vent and they need our silence. So consider that when, when silence is the intervention. Identify what is within someone's control right now, kind of going back to the idea of giving options. Um, for some people, the control is truly minimal. You know, maybe all they can control is going home and making themselves a cup of tea, and that's what they can control. Maybe there's something really profound. You know, maybe someone can control spending really quality time with their children um, and being as good of a parent and as positive of an influence as they can be. That's a really big thing to be able to control. So when someone feels like they have no power over their life, try to brainstorm with them what they really do control. If you know someone well and you know that they might appreciate this, um, you can do some deep breathing, muscle relaxation, grounding or mindfulness skills. Um, the internet is an amazing resource for all of these things. You can Google this or go on YouTube. There are amazing um, meditations uh, or grounding exercises that you can pull up in seconds. Um, again, this will depend on your role with the person and your relationship, um, but you know, it can be a great way to just kind of take a time out and maybe say, let's do this together um, and, and see if that kind of diffuses some of the tension of the moment. And ultimately, ask them what their coping skills are. Ask them how they intervene when they're in crisis. You know, we are each the expert on our own lives and on our own selves. So be mindful of the fact that you don't have to have all the answers or all the interventions with someone who's in crisis. They might know what they need to soothe themselves. Some things to avoid, um, not to get too much into the negative, but of course it's important to note um, what to do as well as what not to do. So avoid prejudging someone. Um, when we prejudge and we assume how someone's going to behave or um, what's going on with them, that kind of is a barrier to open communication and it's a barrier to understanding. Avoid not listening. So of course we, we don't want to not listen. Um, that will only cause further escalation. There's no reason not to listen. Avoid arguing, as I said before, and power struggles. Um, there's typically no reason to really engage in a power struggle when someone is escalated. Um, probably you won't be able to really reason with them anyway, as we talked about earlier. So again, really won't help anyone to get into that situation. Avoid criticizing the person or their choices or their behaviors or their reaction to a trigger. Um, again, only going to lead to further escalation. And avoid minimizing. None of us like to feel that our, our problems or our emotions are unimportant because they're all important to us. Some key phrases not to say. Um, I would encourage you not to say things like, I understand, you're lucky that, at least, it'll take some time but you'll get over it, I can imagine how you feel, calm down and try to relax, and you're so strong. So some of these kind of put you in the shoes of the individual you're talking to, um, saying that I can imagine or I understand 
you can't ultimately. Even if we've had similar experiences or we have a trauma history, we're not that specific person. So we don't fully understand exactly what's going on with them. Also saying things like, don't worry, calm down, try to relax, you'll get over it. Um, I think we know that that's not what anyone wants to hear uh, in a moment of intense emotions. And then just a note about the last one, you're so strong. Uh, there are definitely times when using a strengths-based approach, I will highlight a client's strength or resilience getting through past experiences and, and you know, still moving forward. But in the moment of a crisis, a person may not be feeling strong and they may feel like you're minimizing what they're going through in that moment and the stress or distress that they have in that moment. Again, not always a bad thing to say, I just wouldn't recommend it in an escalated situation. And then after de-escalation, so turning the lens back around to us, you know, the helpers or the de-escalators, recognize your personal limits. You know, maybe the person did, you know, go to their peak and you weren't able to intervene. Maybe they were at peak for a long time. That doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means that that is what happened and, and your interventions maybe didn't work out the way that you had hoped. Um, but we all have personal limitations. You know, there are situations for all of us where that are, you know, beyond our, our level of being equipped to handle something. So acknowledge that it's okay, it's not bad, it's just being human. Engage in some debriefing, whether that's in supervision or with a trusted colleague um, or maybe with a spouse, obviously, you know, bearing confidentiality in mind always. Um, we all need that kind of, again, ventilation and validation, just like uh, the, the individuals we serve need that. And again, seek supervision um, and, you know, discuss with your supervisor what you did well, what you didn't do well, um, maybe what you could learn for next time. And self-care. Um, self-care is a lifestyle. It's not just something that we should do after a stressful day. Um, it's something that should be built into our daily life and our daily routine so that we can um, be able to manage these situations as they arise. So I have, uh, we have a few more minutes, so I'm just going to go over a couple practical scenarios, just taking a peek at the chat, don't see any questions. So again, if anyone has questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so I have a few scenarios that I wrote out that are kind of um, different, uh, different scenarios based on people's roles within the agency um, or in the community, and I just, We'll read them and then if anyone wants to comment, that would be great. Or if not, I can kind of break them down a little bit as well. So scenario one, uh, a client arrives for an appointment at a behavioral health clinic. The client is told that their therapist is out sick, and that staff attempted to call, but were unable to reach the client to let them know. The client becomes irate. As the staff attempt to reason with the client, they become increasingly angry and hostile. So I'm curious, you know, if any of the participants have any thoughts on what maybe could be going on for that client um, under the surface and what may be a good way to intervene. If anyone has thoughts, if not, that's okay. I will uh, break it down a little bit. Right. Don't see anything. So I will just uh, go ahead and kind of talk a little bit more about my thoughts on this. And again, feel free to, to say anything in the chat at any point. Um, this person may be, uh, there may be a plethora of things really going on with this person. Um, one, they may just be upset that they can't have their therapy session. Maybe something really um, big happened to them this week and they, uh, you know, really wanted to talk about it and really would have valued that time in therapy. Um, maybe they have very limited gas money and they spent it to drive to the clinic and they're upset that they used that money and, you know, never got the call that they, uh, you know, wouldn't, weren't going to have their session that day. Um, maybe they've dealt with really inconsistent therapists in the past who had tons and tons of sick days. Um, and, and that's a trigger for them. 
maybe they have some paranoia and they think the therapist called out sick because they didn't want to see me today. So I know I could go on and on and there could be so many reasons why um, someone is upset in that situation. But again, it's just always important for us to stop and think, okay, what's potentially really going on for this person? You know, we're seeing the anger, but what are all the reasons for that? Um, some interventions may be to really validate and, and listen to what the person is angry about and let them know that this is really unfortunate, you know, that they came all this way to have an appointment and they weren't able to follow through with it. Maybe they just need to hear someone say, I'm so sorry. Um, again, you know, if they're becoming angry and hostile in front of others or, you know, other people waiting, they may need some boundaries set. Um, maybe they need to, to know specifically when they'll hear from the therapist. Um, maybe, you know, if they hear, they'll reach out to you tomorrow. Um, you know, we're here to help. We'll get you in for another appointment this week. Um, that kind of reassurance um, may be helpful as well. So, I'm not sure I'm missing anything. Okay. So, I'll go over uh, one more scenario based on the time. A client calls the CVSS hotline stating they're a victim of domestic violence. The client is convinced they will lose custody of their children and presents as extremely anxious. The client is perseverating on the possibility of losing the children and continues to repeat the same sentences over and over. Eventually, the client states, I'm about to have a panic attack. So this is a, a, a escalation that presents a little differently. You know, we talked about kind of someone becoming more angry and hostile. And then in this scenario, um, they're becoming more and more anxious. And for them, that might be their peak. A panic attack may be the, the peak. Um, so again, some things that may be going on, you know, clearly there's a really stressful situation um, you know, maybe they're dealing with a really manipulative offender. Um, so, you know, from, from the person answering the hotline's perspective, they may be feeling like, well, they probably won't lose custody of their children. Um, they don't need to be this anxious. You know, court isn't going to be for another two months. Um, but there may be very legitimate reason, what, reasons why the person is escalating to this point. So if they're extremely anxious, they may need some self-soothing techniques, they may need grounding techniques, maybe some deep breathing, maybe just reassurance that they're not alone. You know, maybe they're feeling like they'll be fighting in court all by themselves, and maybe they need to hear about the resources that we have accessible to them, uh, you know, in court and, and advocacy and all those things. Obviously, if someone's truly having a panic attack, they may need, um, you know, medical attention or, or support. So of course, there may be some more interventions to do, uh, you know, to get other parties involved as well. But as far as what we can do, um, probably grounding and, and connecting with resources might be the best interventions in this moment. So we are coming up on one o'clock. I don't want to go over time. Um, so I will, I guess, stop screen sharing and uh, wrap up. And of course, if there's any questions, feel free um, to ask in these last couple moments. Thanks, Joanna, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank I you, appreciate Bill. it. All right, I'm gonna um, so I'm gonna stop recording now. All right, perfect. I don't see anything in the chat unless you want to okay. give it more minutes, but I don't see anything yet. All right, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Joanna. Have a great day. You too. Take care. All right.